as we are all, first of all, under obedience to God, and only then under obedience to men. And there's a very interesting poem that my good friend Gilbert Keith Chesterton wrote about the name of God. In the Old Testament, and even at the time of the New Testament, it was normal, everyday thinking, and good thinking too, that the name is not only means to distinguish one guy from another, but that the name stands for his real being. So in the Old Testament, pronouncing the name of God was put under capital punishment. That's slightly exaggerated, but it's good thinking. It is put under capital punishment in the New Testament in the sense that uh, the second commandment says, if you name God in vain, in a serious circumstances, you're in mortal sin against the second commandment. This is why sometimes I will find myself in the condition of having to tell people in the confessional to use certain dirty words, but please don't insult the name of our Lord. You never say Jesus Christ unless you want to pray. You never name the most holy name of Jesus Christ unless you want to pray. If you discover yourself naming Jesus Christ just because you're frustrated, angry, or hurt, then you realize, I hope, that you just uh, committed a sin against the second commandment. Now, the name of God is sacred as God is sacred. And Chesterton describes that very aptly in my favorite poem. The vision of a haloed host that weep around an empty throne, aureoles dark and angels dead, man with his own life stands alone. I am, he says his bankrupt <coughs> creed, I am, and is again a clod. The sparrow starts, the grasses stir, for he has said the name of God. Those of you who understand poetry will immediately know what it means. It means the real name of God is I am. The name of God is so sacred that even God himself pronounces his own name only twice in Holy Scripture. The first time is when Moshe, uh, Moses, is up there in Sinai and he faces a flaming, burning, but not consuming thorn bush, and he hears a voice coming out of the thorn bush, and he says, who are you? And the voice says, I am who am, which is a grammatical contradiction, apparently. <coughs> then he says, okay, uh, I don't understand that anyway, but what do you want me to tell the people down there? Whom did I talk to? And the answer is, tell him that you talk to the one who is. In the New Testament, I believe it's the eighth chapter of John, our Lord says, before Abraham was, I am. The Jews who immediately understood what he was talking about grabbed stones in order to stone him, which was the uh, envisioned capital punishment for the sacrilege of naming the name of our Lord Yahweh. Not Yehovah, but Yahweh. So they tried to stone him, and he had to escape because he had just named the name of God for himself. Well, you know and believe, and I know and believe, that he is the Son of God, the Son of the living God, as Peter called him, and therefore he can say, I am. You cannot. I cannot say, I am. I will have to say, I'm a man. I'm 45. I'm a priest. I'm this and this and this and that. I cannot say, I am, period. God is infinitely simple. He is only being itself. He is the one who is subsistent. We will come back to that. He is the one who is subsistent to everything that is. 
if it was possible that he would cease to exist, we all would perish in the same instant. Everything else would. There is nothing ever without receiving his being from God. If God was to talk about himself without adding a lot of things in order to make himself understood to our primitive and complicated minds, all that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit could say about themselves was, I am. God, Father, cannot say anything but I am. God, Son, cannot say anything but I am. God, Holy Spirit, cannot say anything but I am. If there was anything to be added to it, it's only for our benefit in order to understand, qual understand qualities that are all the same for him. It needs the complicated, extremely fallible, and mostly stupid human mind to distinguish between justice and mercy. Some people believe justice and mercy are opposite to each other. They cannot be, because in God, they are the same. There is no such thing as God merciful and God just. It's the same for him. He is, and if you ask him in heaven, what are you? He will only tell you, I am. There is nothing that can be without God. Christ said that to the apostles. He said, without me, you are nothing. He said on another occasion, everything that you are, you owe to God. St. Paul said, everything that I am, and St. Paul was not stupid. He knew that there was a lot of things that he was, like intelligent, wise, educated, brilliant. He knew it, but he said, it's nothing because I received it all from God. I cannot be anything without God. It is, therefore, and this is the reason why I started my second part of the presentation talking about God himself, it is therefore absurd to talk about obedience in any other context but obedience to God first. If I know the will of God, not through a private inspiration, drop that, forget it. If you feel you have a vision, talk back at the vision badly. If it's an authentic vision, it will make sure to answer the right thing. Forget visions, miracles, inspirations. They are nothing, nothing. Obey the Ten Commandments and obey the magisterium of the church. That is obedience. You do what the church says and what the church always taught. And you follow the Ten Commandments, no matter who appears to you, no matter what you hear in the vision no matter what you feel in the inspiration. St. Catherine Laboré, she was the one who was given the privilege to reveal the magnificence and the benefits of the miraculous Medal of Our Lady to us. She also had the abs absolutely unbelievable pri privilege of having conversation with Our Lady resting in her lap. She touched Our Lady. She was just having good conversation with Our Lady when in her monastery, the bell rang for vas Vespers. Bing, bing, for Vespers. She said to Our Lady, because she was a saint, not a stupid human being, she said to Our Lady, I'm sorry, I have to go to Vespers. She left Our Lady sitting there and she went for Vespers. The next day, Our Lady told her if yesterday you had not obeyed the bells for Vespers, I would not have come back again. That is to tell you something about obedience. But St. Catherine Laboré, whose body is one of the few still absolutely immaculately preserved, St. Catherine Laboré obeyed to something that was in perfect harmony with the church tradition, with the tradition of her own monastery. It is exactly according to church tradition that when the bell rings for Vespers, you go there. You don't say, I'm sorry, I'm just on the phone. I can't come right now. No, 
If you're talking to the Pope, him, Pope himself, you say, sorry, Holy Father, the best, the, just now, bell for Vespers rang. I call you back tomorrow. Click, you hang up and you go for Vespers. That is church tradition. You follow church tradition in obedience, then you obey in the sense that our Lord was talking about obedience. Today, they have a different concept of obedience. They are the people who tell you that no matter what you think, no matter what they said in the old days, no matter how you believed it to be, if the Pope tells you to do it, then you do it. That's the old saying, um, the Pope dyes his hair green, you better do it too. With the present Pope, I wouldn't be surprised, but that's not Christian or Catholic obedience. Back in Germany or Austria, they used to say, the way the Pope clears his throat, you are supposed to spit. That is a type of obedience that you will find in a military dictatorship. It's a type of obedience that you will find, find in other types of dictatorship. It's a type of obedience that even in the good old days before Hillary turned it into a liberal outfit, would have been unthinkable in the armed forces of the United States. Unthinkable, even in basic training. It would have been unthinkable that the sergeant would get away with telling you, burn down the barracks. Unthinkable. However, there's a multitude of people out there running around who, without even blushing, would tell you to do that if the Pope asked it. And this is the second step for today's reasoning. The Pope is not, as such, the head of the church. That's a terrible mistake to say that. Who is the head of the church? Well, Christ only. Only Christ himself. Those of you who are married, if they had Catholic preparation for marriage, know that marriage is something analogical to the relationship of Christ to his church. <coughs> Man represent, is supposed to represent, supposed to represent Christ, and the wife is supposed to represent the church, and the relationship should be the one of church and Christ. And this is what St. Paul says in one of his epistles, I think it's the Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians, where he says, just like Christ is the head of the church, man, the husband, should be the head of the wife and the family. And just like the church loves Christ and follows Christ, the wife should love and follow her husband. We know in the White House it's the other way around, but the White House does not represent the church. On the contrary, the White House represents the enemy of the church. Obedience itself can only be defined by the Ten Commandments and church tradition, not by some messed up, perverted philosopher of our century. And just like I mentioned the example yesterday, just like in the armed forces, the colonel cannot tell me to shoot my, I'm as not as a priest, but as an officer, the colonel cannot tell me to shoot my wife because even if I was happy about that command and did she shoot her, I would not get away with it. He does not have the right to tell me, shoot your wife. As long as my wife is not attacking the bases I'm stationed in. And uh, commands are, as such, subject to higher rules. If the Pope, in a state of uh, absent-mindedness or being drunk or whatever, would tell you you have the privilege of dining with him, and he would tell you to jump out of the window, third floor of the Apostolic Palace, you would have to say, excuse me, Holy Father, I don't know wh why you're getting off the rocker, but I'm sure not going to do that. And you do not commit a sin. On the contrary, you would if you followed him. The Pope, just like any other human being, is bound to the Ten Commandments. The Pope is bound to the canon law that he published and signed. 
If he wants to, if he, if he doesn't like, if there's something in the canon law that he published and he doesn't like, then he has to change the canon law around as much as this is possible. But he cannot say, yes, well, we are sure, yeah, right, I signed the canon law of 1983, but I'm the Pope and I don't have to follow it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The Pope has to follow the Ten Commandments, the will of Christ, the tradition of the Church, and his own canon law. Pope Pius XI, who was a pretty good Pope, I say, and who certainly knew his business, Pope Pius XI, when he celebrated Mass, did not just choose what her Mass he was going to say today. You know, there's quite some differences. You will have uh, one saint celebrated in one diocese and nowhere else, and then you will have another saint celebrated all over the world, but then in your diocese he's not celebrated because that's the feast of the dedication of the cathedral of your diocese, and whatever. So there are differences. Now, uh, Pius XI, as Pope, had to choose what calendar he will use. He was sitting up there in the Apostolic Palace, which, basically speaking, is the jurisdiction of Vatican City. Sometimes he was celebrating in St. Peter's Basilica, which is the jurisdiction of St. Peter's Basilica. Sometimes he was celebrating in some churches in Rome, which is the jurisdiction of Rome. And uh, later on, when popes started to travel, they had to face the, the situation of celebrating somewhere else, which was the jurisdiction of so-and-so. Pope Pius XI, who was not foolish enough to fall for all these traps like they do today, celebrated Mass every day, strictly, if he liked it or not, strictly, according to the, cal to the calendar of the Basilica of St. John the Lateran in Rome, because as pope, he is the titular priest of that basilica. He is the, so, so, so to speak, he is the archpriest of the Basilica of St. John of the Lateran. That is his church. Like a parish priest has his church, and Father Boldak has his church. He's the boss in this church, and nobody else is. In the same way, Pope Pius XI, as a priest celebrating Mass, he was the boss in St. John of the Lateran. So he used the calendar of St. John of the Lateran. That was a pope who understood the concept of obedience. The present pope grew up in a concept of dictatorship in Poland and obviously hasn't learned anything from it because he expects us to do things that we must not do. And here we are at the topic of today. What is the limit to obedience towards the pope? Towards the end of my today's uh, presentation, I'm going to answer a few very intelligent and excellent questions that somebody, I don't know who, asked on this little sheet of paper together with an article published by a criminal in Rome whom I'm going to talk about later. One of the questions is, aren't we bound in total obedience to the Pope? The answer is definitely not. What are the limits to the Pope's li freedom of decision? Well, the Pope cannot go against the following four things. First of all, he cannot contradict the gospel. Second, he cannot contradict the church fathers. Third, he cannot contradict the first four councils, or any council as far, the first four councils as such, and he cannot contradict any further council as long as it is not dog dogmatically defined. Dogmatically defined things he cannot contradict. Things that the council decided forever, such as moral decisions, he cannot contradict. If we talk about disciplinary regulations, which always were issued at councils, and which nobody bothers to put in a collection of church teaching, yes, of course he can but not dogmatic and moral decisions of a council. Number four, he cannot contradict what is called status ecclesia, the state the church finds itself in. The state doesn't mean the present situation, like the state you find yourself in right now. The state is something unchangeable. See, I am in the status religionis, in the status sacerdotalis, the state of my life is being a priest, and no matter if I go to heaven, purgatory, or hell, I will still be a priest. 
I am sacerdos in eternum, a priest in eternity. God himself cannot take away my priesthood because he has decided to give it to me and he cannot contradict himself. My good friend, the Italian composer Antonio Vivaldi, most of you only know his Four Seasons, which is sad. He wrote 450 beautiful concerts and 30 operas. Antonio Vivaldi is dead ever since the 28th of July, 1641. Excuse me, 40, 1741. Antonio Vivaldi still is a priest. Claudia Monteverdi, his predecessor in music, still is a priest today. Once a priest, always a priest. Like they say, you know, once in the army, always in the army. But that means as long as you live, okay? A priest is in eternity, always, always in the army of God. So I'm in the status such a totalis that doesn't change, it can't change. Sister, right here, or a bishop, are in the status perfectionis, in the state of perfection. If anybody offered me to consecrate me a bishop, I would have to think twice about it because I would have to give up all my hobbies, I would have to give up my beautiful wines, uh, not, not, not this one here, but I mean the vintage wines, the bottled wines, the expensive ones. I would have to give up everything because I would join the status perfectionis, the state of perfection, which is aptly described by St. Teresa of Avila, saying that in the status perfectionis, there is nothing but your belonging to God. You become the total, absolute, and total property of God. You replace your own soul and your own self with Christ. That's the status perfection. That state of life, as you call it in English, is basically unchangeable once you're in it. For the bishop, it is perfectly unchangeable. For sister, it is relatively unchangeable. The state of the church is something the church will find herself in unchangeably forever. To show you what I mean, there are three steps, major steps, in the sacrament of priesthood. Diaconate, priesthood, and Episcopal consecration. But there are the so-called minor orders. The highest of the minor orders is the subdiaconate. When Paul VI transgressed his faculties by making the subdiaconate optional, Another interesting thing, by the way, you remember when yesterday I said that the, the new mass was n never really published and that Vatican II was never, never really became ob obligatory. The same thing here again. The Holy Spirit is not dead. The Holy Spirit works in the church. When Paul VI said we don't need the sub subdiaconate, he still left it up to the individual bishop to confer it or not. That's interesting. However, he went far beyond of what he's allowed to do when he said we don't need the subdiaconate anymore. The subdiaconate is going back to the earliest apostolic times of the church. Therefore, it is part of the status ecclesia, the state of the church finds herself in. Now, yesterday, I hope I have made it sufficiently and abundantly clear to you that the Holy Mass, the way we know it here in this chapel, is part of the church tradition and that it is perfectly illegal and impossible to change that. So Holy Mass, the way you and I know it, is part of the state of the church, status ecclesia. The Pope tries to change that. You say, sorry, Holy Father, but can't follow that. Too bad. If the Pope tries to change anything that is part of the status ecclesia, and you follow him, and you should know better, then you're in the state of mortal sin unless you don't know better. But to follow the Pope into error means not obedience, but sin. Remember what St. Paul said, if an angel out of heaven was to bring you another gospel, don't accept it, even if an angel himself. And for those of you who understand poetry and understand the depth of poetry, what Chesterton really means when he says, and if an angel out of heaven brings you other things to drink, thank him for his kind attention, go and pour them down the sink. This is what he really meant. 
Chesterton himself drank beer and quite barrels of it. So what he says in this poem that I quoted yesterday means, don't allow anything to creep into the gospel in its purity as it was preserved by the church. See, this in a way is the gospel because Father and I up there on the altar, we're not allowed to do that, but Father and I up there on the altar can turn this innocent looking cup of wine into the blood of Christ if we used it for mass. We'd be committing a sin because we're not allowed to, lose a, to use a glass chalice and we're not used, allowed to use this type of wine. We have to use mass wine. Doesn't matter if it's white or red, by the way, but we have a practical reason not to use uh, red wine. But uh, we are allowed to use it. The point is, we can do it. So this is representing the, pu the purity of the gospel. And that's what Chesterton meant. Anybody who dares to interfere with the purity of church teaching, to interfere with the purity of church tradition, to interfere with the purity of the gospel, is a messenger of the devil, not an angel. And if it was the Pope himself. And believe me, this concept, the idea of a Pope being a traitor to church teaching is not new. Not at all. I could show you in a different context a document that was issued by Pope Pius II in the year 1460, talking about the appeal to a council. In those days, some people thought, if we, you don't like the Pope, you go to the emperor, you ask the emperor to, to, to call in a council. And so calling in a council, you, get, you would get either rid of the Pope or rid of his last decision. So Pope Pius II said, no way. And he wrote the, pa the famous papal bull, Execrabilis, because he found it was execra an execrable idea to call in a council against the Pope, and said, whosoever dares to call in a council against a Pope is automatically in the state of total excommunication reserved to the Holy See in the strictest way means only the Pope personally can absolve you from that excommunication. And then Pope Pius II in the same document says, and be careful what I say because that will explain a lot of other things I say today. He says, no matter who does that, be it an emperor or a Pope, he still is in excommunication. So Pope Pius II in 1460 realized that it was possible for a pope himself to be excommunicated. And of course it is. In the new code of canon law, there are very few excommunications left. One of the excommunications left in the new code of canon law is if you take the consecrated host, the Blessed Sacrament, for example, and you use it to make those, what you call them, with the egg white on top in the oven, a uh, kind of cookie, you know. You use a consecrated host, our Lord Jesus Christ, in order to pre prepare dessert for your guests. That's an unbelievable and outrageous sacrilege. Now, you, if, if you, I, mean, it, uh, I hope none of you believes even for an instant that the Pope is incapable of doing that. Of course he's capable of doing that. He's a human being, and he could sin like you and me. He can do wrong things wrong. Pope Alexander VI, while he was Pope, had children. Is that the right thing to do? I don't think so. I mean, sure it isn't. The guy was enjoying himself, and he's not supposed to. So he had children. He said, so what? And uh, popes did other things, too. There are stories about popes uh, murdering other people. Well, I don't see why a pope couldn't do it. He should not do it. He must not do it. But I don't see why he was not be, would not be able to do it. So the Pope himself could work, could do a sacrilege that puts himself in the state of excommunication reserved to the Holy See. How is that possible? Can he give absolution to himself like that? No. When a Pope, you see, a Pope has a confessor, okay? Just like you and me. A Pope has a confessor. So if a Pope commits a sin that is under excommunication, strictly reserved to the Holy See, he has to seek his confessor and say, uh, Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. I've done this and this. The confessor will go, what? I can't give you absolution for that. And he says, Pope will say, 
the Pope is, knows what he talk, what he's talking about, I hope. And he will say, I know you can't give me a solution of, uh, uh, about, uh, on, on that, but you just go the, the regular way. So the Pope, without mentioning who was his uh, penitent, will approach the office in the Vatican, which is called the, Apostol the, 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 the Penitentiaria Apostolica, the Apostolic Penitentiary, and there he will, uh, he will anonymously denounce that sin and say, listen, yesterday a guy confessed to me who said he did this and this and this. And then they will examine the case. The, the confessor might have to ask questions about this again. And then without naming who it is, he will talk to the cardinal in the Penitentiaria Apostolica. And then the cardinal will, most probably if it's the first time, say, okay, you can give absolution to this guy. So in that case, this cardinal decides in the name of the pope, and that's how a pope could get absolution for a sin that is punished with a reserved absolution. So the concept of a pope being outside the church is old. Many popes talked about it. Pope Innocent III said that. Pope Innocent III said, to all of his successors and all bishops, he said, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that because you have the graces, the power, and the dignity of the office, it doesn't matter if you commit a sin like this. And he reminded his successors, saying, who cannot be judged by men will be judged all the more by God. With God, there is only justice in no contradiction to mercy. And the most culpable person on earth is always the Pope, no matter what happens, because he's the highest up. He is the highest person on earth. He's not the, he's not the head of the church. He's only the highest person in the church. He is the highest bishop in the church, the highest priest in the church. He is the sumus pontifex, the highest priest on earth. Like in ancient Rome, the sumus pontifex was the highest peacekeeper, the one who built the bridge between two hills in Rome that fought each other, namely the Palatine and the Capitol Hill. He was the one who guarded the bridge, which was the symbol of peace between two tribes that fought each other to almost to extinction. And then they found that the religious solution might be a wise one, and they found the guy who built the bridge, which was the symbol of peace, where they could say hi to each other instead of wiping out each other. And that was the pontifex, the priest. And the sumus pontifex was the highest of them all. That is what the pope is. He's not Christ. He's not the founder of the church. He's not even the head of the church. He's the vicar of Christ. And ever since Gregory the Great, Saint Gregory the Great, the highest title of the pope is Servus Servorum Dei, the servant of the servants of God. The pope does a very bad service to you if he does not represent the, the, the church doctrine in its entirety, and he does a very bad service to you if he lies to you about church doctrine or the gospel. And I mentioned to you yesterday that in the Constitutio Dogmatica Pastor Eternus, the Ecclesia Christi of the 18th of July, 1870, at the First Vatican Council, in the fourth chapter it says, the Holy Spirit has not been given to the successors of Peter, so in order that with his revelation they can t uh, publish a new doctrine, but that with his assistance they will saintly safeguard and faithfully interpret the tradition handed down from the apostles, the deposit of faith. That is the Pope's duty. If he does not stick to this duty, you do not obey him. Pope Pius IX, servant of God, Pius IX, in a letter to the Bishop of Brixen in Northern Italy, once upon a time in Austria, in those days he was part of Austria, in this letter, which you can find under number 5,500 something, forgot the rest, in the famous collection of uh, papal letters and documents, Mansi, M-A-N-S-I, Mike Alpha November Sierra India, that's how you spell it. In that collection, number 5,500 something, you find a letter written by Pope Pius IX that explains to the Bishop of Brixen, if a future Pope was to pronounce heresy, you simply disregard it and don't obey. So far, Pope Pius IX on the topic. Now, 
We've talked about God. We've talked about the highest principle in the church because this is what you have to understand. The question is, are we not in disobedience to the Pope? Because the Pope would tell Father Bulldog and he would tell me that we have to celebrate the new Mass and we don't do it and we will never do it over our dead bodies. Amen. So are we not in disobedience to the Pope? Well, we are in disobedience to Karel Wojtyla, not to the Pope, not to the highest principle in the church. The Pope is only the vicar of Christ. He's only the servant of the servants of God. He's really nothing else but that. He fails to do his duty in this. I will not listen to him. I will not listen to a pope who proclaims heresy. The present pope, and before anybody walks out on me now, you better hear and wait for my proof for what I say. The present pope is the most heretical pope in history. No pope ever in history was such a heretic. However, there were heretical popes before the present one, there were heretical popes before John the 23rd, even. There was that funny little old pope, Liberius. When you look at the list of popes, for the first two centuries, all popes became saints. All of them. It is Saint Peter, Sanctus Petrus, Sanctus Linus, Sanctus Cletus, Sanctus Clemens, and so on. And then at a certain point, you will find instead of Sanctus so and so, just simply Liberius, Liberius, period. That guy was a heretic. He joined in with a multitude of people and a vast majority of bishops at the time. Sounds familiar. With the heresy that Jesus Christ was not really God himself. I hate heresy. I have to have a gulp of wine with that. The church never said Liberius was not Pope. Then there was Honorius, another abominable creature on the throne of Peter, who said that Christ had only one will. If you really put your common sense to it, then you don't even need dogma to understand what I'm talking about and why he was wrong, because Remember in Holy Week when it says Christ was obedient, obedient to his death. Obedient? With one will? Submitting one will to what? Impossible. Christ was and is the second person of God, divine will. And he is a full human being. There is no such thing as a full human being without a will, a free will. That's the difference to the most intelligent animal. The most intelligent animal does not have a soul, therefore not a will, and it doesn't have an intellect. It cannot reflect upon its own recognitions. The dolphin is known for being the most intelligent being around except for man. Some men are definitely more stupid than a dolphin, but basically a dolphin is the most intelligent animal. They have huge brains and they know how to put them to use. The military found out. Well, um, the Navy especially, you know. Uh, a dolphin does not have the faculty of will, and it does not have the faculty of intellect because it cannot reflect upon its own thinking and thoughts. And I've never seen a dolphin painting or writing. All human beings do. The oldest human beings were the ones who painted in a cave. And uh, Christ as a human being, therefore, had to have a human will, which is the only explanation for the otherwise uh, uh, absurd statement that Christ submitted to the will of God. How could Christ, not having a will, submit to the will of God? Impossible. Perfectly impossible. But uh, this doesn't keep uh, from Honorius, who obviously was not uh, exactly uh, equipped with an IQ of 120, uh, didn't keep Honorius from saying Christ has only one will. That heresy was called monotheism, which is uh, coming from the Greek term mono, one, and theleia, the will. 
as if we didn't have enough heretics in church history already, then came up John the 22nd, who was a frog, excuse me, a Frenchman. And uh, he said, the souls of the dead cannot go to heaven before the last judgment. That means, what he was saying was, the moment a person kicks the bucket, the soul is suspended somewhere, who knows where, and he can't go to hell and he can't go to heaven before the last judgment. That's against the explicit definition, dogmatic definition, of the Fourth Council of Constantinople, which said, the moment a human being dies, that human being will get the personal judgment from God, his soul will go to heaven, his soul will go to hell or purgatory. So now we got St. Pius X in heaven, we got a lot of people in purgatory, and we got the democratic presidents, and, oh, sorry, I'm not allowed to mention individuals. We got a lot of people in hell. <laughs> and uh, John the 22nd, until the day of his death, insisted that the souls of the dead could not go to heaven before the last judgment. The University of Paris, which at the time was a good university, now we won't talk about it, told him, said, are you crazy? You can't say that. He said, uh, of course I will say it, I'm the Pope. He even wrote it down. He wrote letters in which he said, well, we all know that the souls of the dead cannot go to heaven before the last judgment. The man was a heretic in writing and speaking until the day of his death. Yes, but when you look up the Annuario Pontificio, which is the yearbook of the popes and the cardinals and the bishops in the church, it's a whole list of all the popes that ever were, a uh, close description of the present pope, of all the cardinals, and then you get the list of all the real bishops and the auxiliary bishops, and then of all the, uh, the Roman Curia. And in there you will find John the Twenty Second listed among the popes, and another guy, forgot his name, who cares, listed as anti-pope. So the heretic is listed among the popes, the other one was maybe not even a heretic. It goes to show you that heresy alone does not make a pope cease to be a pope. And yesterday, with, uh, day before yesterday, with all the distinctions I gave you, by now you should also know why. Because John XXII did not say, I am not the least interested in what the Council of Constantinople said on the subject. I tell you they were wrong, and it's the other way around. No. He just said, no, 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 come, come on, I don't, I don't want to hear this. The souls do not go to heaven before the last judgment. That's all he said. But he was wrong. He was pronouncing material heresy, but he was not a formal heretic because he did not want to put what he said in a direct, clear, published, and declared contradiction to church teaching. He personally was stupid enough to think that this was the way to interpret church doctrine. He did not want to change church doctrine. At least that is not to be proven. We have no proof that he wanted to change church doctrine. He thought that's the way to interpret it. He did not declare the intention of becoming a heretic. This is the problem with the present pope, except the present pope is obviously not satisfied with one heresy like the other ones, Liberius, Honorius, and uh, John the 22nd. No, for the present pope, that's not good enough. He has to dwell in at least a half a dozen of heresies. I've just called the present pope a heretic. If I don't give you the proof right away, then I'm in the state of mortal sin, and you are not worth it to me to be in the state of mortal sin, if you understand what I'm saying. So you will get the proof. When you say the creed, not the creed at Mass, which is the long, the extended, Const Constantinopolitan creed, but when you say the, the creed of the apostles, you know what I'm talking about, the, the short creed, the creed of the apostles, you talk about Christ dying and descending to hell. That's what it says in the creed, he descended to hell. Now, that term hell is not in discussion here. There's no, no, no question about it. We're not talking about the hell of the damned souls. We are talking about the hell, that part of hell, that not he that non-heaven, to put it in pol cor politically correct talk, the non-heaven, uh, where the, the just and the saints of the Old Testament 
in a, in a perfect state of natural happiness, we're just waiting to be led into heaven. They've just been waiting there. It was a perfect state of happiness. So that's not the point. Now, church doctrine says the moment our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, his soul descended to hell because his body was in the grave. Death is defined as the separation of soul and body. That's the definition of death. Your soul and your body do not separate, you're not dead, period. So the moment Christ died, the council says, this is the fourth Lateran council in a dogmatic definition, dogma. The moment Christ died, his soul descended to hell because his body was in the grave. <coughs> Not so for John Paul II. He said on the 11th of January, 1988, the line in the creed, the Christ descended to hell is to be understood in a metaphorical sense, <laughs> meaning that his body was laid in the grave while his soul at the same moment received the beatific vision. That is just ever so slightly opposite to what the council defined. If he says, I repeat, and I mean, there's not even a political reason to say this. So this is what, what, what puzzles me. The moment Christ died, he descended to hell. That is to be understood in a metaphorical sense because the body was laid in the grave, in the underworld, the grave, you know. It's below the potatoes, as we say, so the underworld, you know, in the grave. At the same time, his soul receiving beatific vision. This pope really never ceases to puzzle me because in one line he pronounces a double heresy. The first heresy is that he says the fact that Christ descended to hell is to be understood in a metaphorical sense. That very form formula has been condemned by Pope Pius X and before him Pope Pius IX and before him Gregory XVI who called such a formulation madness. That very concept has been explicitly condemned by Pope Pius X in his Lamentabili document. But anyway, Pope says this is to be understood metaphorically because Christ was laid into the grave, the underworld, while his soul at the moment of death received the beatific vision. So here he is contradicting directly, undoubtedly, the dogmatic definition of the Fourth Lateran Council. At the same time, he's contradicting sacred tradition. Do you, in all earnest, believe it possible that the human nature of Christ, in the same person as the per second person of the Trinity, would not have beatific vision from the moment of conception? The same person? Jesus Christ is the same person as the person, second person of God, the Son of God. They only have two different natures, but it's the same person. Now, uh, is it that somehow in that same person, the beatific vision just never made it into Christ's human being? Or is it that the second person of God somehow ceased to have the beatific vision for a while? Well, both is blasphemy, heresy, and absurd. The church never even bothered to make the issue of the beatific vision of our Lord Jesus Christ a dogma because everybody would have said, I don't need the church for that. I know that. If the human nature of Christ and the divine nature of the second person of God are united in the same person, how would it be possible, conceivable, thinkable that there's no beatific vision for Christ? But no. For John Paul II, he received the beatific vision on the cross dying. Great. That cannot be error, you see. That cannot be error. Because even with the lousy cardinals and bishops in the Vatican around today, you can bet your life that somebody 
at least the good old Cardinal Chappi, Dominican house theologian of the Pope, would have pointed all of this out to the Pope. I mean, this was printed in the Osservatore Romano. I'm not making this up. This was in a newspaper, and so and so many hundreds of people heard the Pope saying this in an audience. And the Pope is reading the Osservatore Romano. I mean, if he finds this in there and he doesn't like it, uh, it's not sufficient for a Pope to say, I don't like this. He will have to call the editor and say, hey, what's the matter with you, bum? <laughs> but no, the Osservatore Romano for the last 20 years is packed with heresy almost every week, once. Here, I just, just gave you one example, another example. And this is now, I mean, real, the writing of the Pope, his signature. I told you yesterday that uh, it is not possible to be saved outside the church. You know that anyway. The Pope says that the efforts of the Protestants will be rewarded by Christ giving them salvation. So the efforts of the Protestants. For those of you who like to check on things, Catechesi Tradende, number 32, says, Spiritus Christi, uh, excuse me, um, quarum ope Spiritus Christi non abnuit salutem affere, for whose efforts the Spirit of Christ does not deny salvation. Okay? Whose efforts refers to the sentence before, where they mention Ecclesiae Protestantice. I don't want to go into the fact that uh, to call the Protestant churches churches is a heresy in itself, because it's uh, secondary to what we are talking about. It's <coughs> collateral heresy. But uh, he says that Christ does not refrain from giving salvation to the efforts of the Protestant churches. I explained to, to you in my last uh, presentation that even if the little innocent child dies and goes to heaven because he was baptized by a Protestant church, by a Protestant pastor, excuse me, by a Protestant pastor, that that Protestant pastor administered the Catholic, the Catholic sacrament of baptism illegally, illegally because a heretic and a schismatic must not do that. So that's not really Christ giving salvation to the efforts of Protestant churches, but it's Christ giving salvation according to his own promise to the Catholic sacrament of baptism, even though it was administered illegally. It's like the old, there is a, I, I usually don't find many German idioms all too uplifting, but there is one German idiom that I find brilliant. Man kann Gott schmähen, aber nicht schmälern. You can insult God, but not diminish him. If God promised salvation for baptism, the Protestant pastor cannot take it away. But God does not give his salvation for the efforts of that guy. That is heresy. But there, again, the Pope is only quoting Vatican II. Then the Pope says, Yesterday, we talked about that. The tradition is something to be, uh, to, that knows progress, and the progress comes about through the studies and meditations of, hum of, of, of the faithful. We have discussed that abundantly well the day before yesterday, and there were no questions on it, so I don't have to mention it again. I gave you, within uh, something like 20 minutes, I gave you three examples of heresy in one and the same pope. I also mentioned the fact already that Pope says the moment Christ died, he saved all human beings. And he did not add the necessary term in potency. So the way it is written, as is, as you say, it is heresy. Now, why is it that if the Pope is a heretic, he's still Pope? Well, that's one of the reasons why I mentioned the three examples before John the 23rd. John the 23rd was a heretic too, and so was Paul VI. But this is why I mentioned the three popes before. Liberius is recognized as pope. I mean, you can hardly get more heretical than by saying Christ was not fully son of God, was not fully God. Honorius is considered pope. It is perfectly stupid to say Christ had only one will, and yet Honorius did. He was considered pope. John the 22nd pronounced direct her heresy and wrote it down against the Fourth Lateran Council. Oh, excuse me, the Fourth Council of Constantinople. And he's considered Pope. 
It's because it's not easy for somebody just to, 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 to seize in his office. That's what I told you the day before yesterday. If I was to tell you heresy by mistake, you can bet your life on the fact that it was a mistake and not my intention to do so. I do not cease to be your teacher just because I made one mistake. If every teacher that made one mistake would cease to be teacher, there would be no teachers left on earth. I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, this country now, thanks to the government, is in a pretty uh, bad state of a mess. But you cannot even start to imagine the mess it would mean if a president of the United States would cease to be president, simply he pronounces heresy against the Constitution, which he has sworn to upheld and protect and defend. If he ceased to be president, just simply he made a mistake in upholding, defending, and protecting the Constitution, uh, then uh, I think I, I, I have not the slightest idea how long we, the White House is vacant already, would be vacant already. Who was the first president to go uh, against his duty to protect, defend, and uphold the Constitution? That's his question for historians. But surely it, this one is not the first. That goes without saying. So uh, the moment the president ceases to protect the, the Constitution, to uphold it, and to uh, follow it, he does not cease automatically to be president. If he betrays the country, which the, president, the, the present president does all the time, if there is betrayal of the country, she does not immediately cease to be president. You have to impeach her. <laughs> now, the only difference here is the pope cannot be impeached. So if a pope was to proclaim heresy as a dogma defined with all the necessary formulas, the canon lawyers almost agree that he would just simply cease to be pope, the bishops would have to be called in to do something about it. But we're not sure about that because it never happened, and I don't believe it ever will happen because then I would start to doubt about what the Holy Spirit was doing at the moment. Right? And we don't want that. So I, uh, I, I think, and you will be able to ask questions later, I think I have answered those questions. Now, I talked about obedience. See, this present pope is not only a heretic, he's also a schismatic. Because I explained to you yesterday that Pope Eugene IV's uh, favorite theologian, Cardinal Torquemada, Juan de Torquemada from Spain, said that the pope who was to attempt to change around all the sacraments and the Holy Mass put himself outside the church. Schism, therefore. Now, the present pope while in 1988 was kind enough, quote-unquote, to issue that fraudulent letter, Ecclesia Dei, that says the bishops, please grant, be a little bit more generous on granting old priests and those few unfortunate groups who don't understand the new doctrines uh, an easy access to the, new ma to the old mass. A year later, and this shows you how honest he is, a year later, and this is in printing, he said he finds it valde dolendum very hurtful that there are so many groups in the church that are still personally attached to the old forms of veneration. That means you and poor Father Boldak and I are just a bunch of fools who, per, who subjectively feel somehow emotionally attached to these outdated forms of worship. I mean, this in itself is a schismatic that is not the consecrations of bishops. That is a schismatic act. That is schismatic. Because by saying that, he says, in printing, he says that he doesn't give you know what about what the Council of Trent said, about what his predecessors said, about what St. Pius V said, about what his predecessors did and upheld. But his predecessors represented the church as such that is schism. That is cutting off the unity with the church. Like when in Redemptor Hominis, 1978, his first encyclical, he defines, he defines the unity of the church as a unity of uh, synods and episcopal conferences and uh, parish councils and priest councils and diocesan councils. He does not at once mention the unity of the church as it is dogmatically defined. A perfect society 
united under the same Peter and united in the same faith and the same religion, that means the, the, wor the worship, the rites, R-I-T-A-S, the rites, the liturgy. No, he doesn't mention that. No, it's the parish council, the parish Soviet, the Yossesen Soviet, uh, priest Soviet in the diocese, it's the, the bishop Soviet in the country, it's the bishop Soviet in, on the continent, and it's the, the, the synod Soviet in Rome. Soviet means council, nothing else. A pope who defines the unity of the church as such does not know what the church is. He doesn't even know what it is. And this explains at the same time to you why he is a schismatic but doesn't cease to be pope. Objectively, he's a schismatic. He's not in unity with the church because he rejects what unites the church, namely liturgy and faith. He doesn't celebrate the mass. He celebrates a crummy new rite that belongs in a trash can. And he doesn't uphold the faith because he pronounces heresy. But at the same time, he doesn't know what he's talking about, quite obviously. That doesn't make him cease to be pope. That only makes the poor guy a heretic and a schismatic that God will judge, not you and not I. We do not judge the pope here. But we have to clarify our state in the church. When we say we do not obey him, we have to add the most important and vital distinction. We do not obey him as long as he's a heretic and schismatic. If we were to say we do not obey him, period, then we are the schismatics. No, we must be precise on that. I do not obey the pope as long as he's a heretic and schismatic. As long as the pope does not pay, take his heresies back publicly, I will not listen to him. As long as the pope does not take back the Novus Ordo Misse, which is against the will of Christ, I will not obey his commands on that subject. No way. I do not obey illegal commands. If I was an officer in the United States Army, I would follow army regulations. I would follow, even if it hurts, and believe me, today it hurts more than ever. I would follow what my, what my superior legally commands me to do. But if my superior was to tell me, you will go to the Novus Ordo Mass ch celebrated by our chaplain next Sunday, I will say, no, sir! In the army, he can't do anything about it. That's the difference. <laughs> In the conciliar church, you're finished the moment you say that. But obedience is subject to dogma, not the other way around. Obedience is never more important than faith. And if anybody says to you, you are a schismatic, you say, uh-uh, not me, you. <laughs> you go to a mass that's against the will of Christ. I don't. I go to Father Boldak's mass. He doesn't do anything against the will of Christ. Of course, there are personal sins with Father Boldak. There are personal sins that I commit. And we have to go to confession like anybody else. But what he does, not being Hector Bolduc, but being father, as it says out there on the note, father. But being father, what he does here is what the church wants. You ask us, you, very often people ask me about the visibility of the church, the indefectibility of the church. How come, with all this mess we got, we can still talk about the church being visible and indefectible. Next Sunday, I'm going to celebrate the high mass, and Father Boldak will celebrate the low mass. The Sunday after, Father Boldak will celebrate both masses. Whatever you see, it is of not the slightest importance if it is Dr. Hesse or Father Boldak celebrating up there. Who cares? The important thing is what we do up there is the church visible? You see the church because you see that in a pretty much similar way, not all too identical, but pretty much similar way, we come out here with the chalice, we genuflect, we go up to the altar, we start nomini patris, it filiates spiritus sanct. It's the same, basically. What you see 
you find in your missile. You got your Sunday missile. Your Sunday missile doesn't say latest edition 1998 spring, <laughs> something like that. Your Sunday missile says 1962 and earlier. So your Sunday missile dates back to the old days. There is no such thing as a 1998 spring missile. <laughs> Well, in the, in, 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 in the Church of the New Advent out there, you have a 1998 Spring Edition, 1998 Summer Edition, 1998 Fall Edition, and so on, as you got it with a quarterly newspaper or a magazine. If I, want the, if I want the writing 1998 Spring on something, then I prefer the Veranda Magazine, which is, by the way, beautiful, beautiful, <laughs> and uh, something like that, but not with a missile. A missile represents the Church Eternal, the Church here. And in a way, even though the church will cease to be as such at the last judgment, there is something as the church eternal, the bride of Christ, that cannot die. The in St. Patrick's Cathedral, with the loudspeakers on the pillars and the Mateve monitors there, so you can follow the beautiful happenings up front. That is not the church visible. That is heresy visible. That is the neo-Protestantism visible. That is the church of the new advent visible. Who said it's the Church of the New Advent. Pope John Paul II in his first encyclical. That is the conciliar church visible. Who calls it that? Pope John Paul II in his first encyclical. Who does not speak about the Roman Catholic Church or the Catholic Church in his first encyclical? John Paul II in Redemptor Hominis. But here in this church, and later on, if you are good enough to help in the church over there, you will see the church visible. And there you will see the indefectibility of the church much better than you could see it in the 1950s. You know, all the trouble, all the, the battles, all the fights, the priests like Father Boldak and I had to go through in order to be able to sit here and teach you about what the church teaches, that is the indefectibility of the church visible. See, even that vast majority of bums even those, the North American Episcopal Conference, those criminals out there could not keep us from teaching what the church teaches. If that is not indefectibility, then I don't know what is. The church as such is indefectible. But the indefectibility of the church does not mean that all of the members are all right. A certain Dr. Martin Luther got quite confused in the 16th century when he found out that the Pope who, who uh, reigned between 1490 and, four, and 1503 had children. He was scandalized. I'm talking about Pope Alexander VI who had children while he was Pope. And Martin Luther made a terrible mistake. He said, the church is not indefectible. The papacy, therefore, does not represent the church. The papacy is not infallible, because an infallible pope could never, ever have children. I don't see the logics. The fact that I would have the Holy Spirit guaranteed to me if I was a pope does not make me impotent, excuse me if I name it in these terms. And it certainly does not make me cease to be a sinner. And it certainly, uh, the Holy Spirit does not lock the doors to the, apart to the papal apartments. The Holy Spirit does not keep a uh, 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 morally degraded woman of approach from approaching the Pope. Uh, this, there's no logic in that. It has nothing to do with the indefectibility of the church. It has nothing to do with the fact that the church is a perfect society. The, the church has never said we have only perfect members. You know that there were priests and bishops who said only the perfect members are members of the church? Do you know that that was condemned as a heresy? Jansenism and Donatism, two heresies. In the old days when the understanding of the church was much, much better than now, whoever said that the church can only have perfect members was a heretic. The church is composed of an awful lot of sinners. But as such, it is indefectible and a perfect society. And now, this brings us to some of the questions that were asked today. One of the first ones being, 
Michael Davis, you know Michael Davis, I guess. Michael Davis says that since the church is indefectible, it could not come up with such an abomination of, as the Novus Ordo. The church never came up with the Novus Ordo. The church didn't. A traitorous, non-believing, schismatic pope came up with the new mass, namely Paul VI of most infelicitous memory. He had the new mass written up by a Freemason named Bonini. He published the new mass against the will of the church, but not even he managed to give his signature to a document that would oblige you to use it, or me. The church indefectibility has never been touched in the least by the fact that that abomination of the Novus Order was published. Michael Davis suffers from a partial new heresy that we have been warned of, warned about in the 1920s, when a certain Abbé Laroche, French priest, said, now that Pius X has effectively dealt with the heresy of modernism, we are going to face the worst of all heresies, and that is the heresy that says that the Pope can do anything one of the most common heresies in the United States of America. Americans are law by nature, by education. They are the best educated people in the world. I know what I'm talking about. Don't run down your country or you will run on the fighting side of me. Like Merle Haggard, Haggard sings, exactly like that. Don't run down your country. Run down your government in eternity, they deserve it. Don't run down your country, there's a difference. Your government does not represent your country. Your government sabotages your country. Your government is about to make your country perish into the United Nations. Your, country, your government is about to destroy and absolutely destroy this country. But in this country, people are still the most polite and well-educated people in the world. They have what is called good manners. They have what is called civilization. If you don't believe me, waste your money on traveling abroad and you'll be in for a lot of surprises, I tell you that. So at the same time, there is no coin without two sides. There's always two sides to a coin. You have been taught to obey the law, and that is the cause for a lot of papalism in this country. Many people in this country are not capable of distinguishing between the lawful authority of the Pope and his dictatorial omnipotence. Well, there is no such thing as a dictatorial omnipotence with the Pope. The Pope tells you to dye your hair green, you will say, ha, 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 good one. <laughs> so the Pope is not in the power to tell you things that are not backed by the church government, by the church tradition, and by the church teaching, on morals especially. And papalism in this country is one of the major causes for so many people attending that boring, stupid, idiotic and imbecile rite called the new mass. This does not change the indefectibility of the mass. Therefore, when Michael Davis fights the district superior of the Society of St. Pius X in Australia, publicly in that abominable uh, paper, The Remnant, then Michael Davis is wrong and the district superior in Australia is right. The new mass is bad in itself, and I explained this to you in my last session. So then, uh, if we have a new faith and religion since Vatican II, can we have one pope over both? That is a very good question, yes. <coughs> Who keeps the pope of the Holy Roman Catholic Church from being at the same time the president of a stupid club? I mean, think about it in logical and realistic terms. Does the papacy exclude automatically, infallibly, membership in a stupid club? No. Where does it say so? No dogma says that. <laughs> no, no pope ever said that. I mean, look, uh, in the old days, uh, the bishop of the diocese of so-and-so, was it impossible for him to be at the same time the member, not only member, but the president of the democratic communist veteran club of the local place? No. What will keep him from doing so, except a good conscience? Nothing. 
He doesn't cease to be bishop because he belongs to some idiotic institution at the same time. Right? And I told you that we have a pope who pronounces one heresy after the other and he doesn't cease to be pope. Why would he cease to be pope if at the same time he heads a Novus Ordo, United Nation, Bani Berit, Jewish Masonry Club called the, the Church of the New Advent, a neo-gnostic sect? He can be, well, the elected vicar of Christ and at the same time the guy in charge of some uh, rascal uh, members of a rascal organization. Does the number mean anything? See, this is another one of those arguments. They tell me, oh, Father Hess, I know Father Hess. Yes, Father Hess, you are right. And 2,800 bishops are wrong. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. 3,500, I don't know, I don't even know how many we got right now. 3,500 bishops are wrong and I'm right. So what? At the times of Pope Liberius, a couple of hundred bishops were wrong and Athanasius was right. Who got the S before his name? Athanasius became Saint Athanasius. Liberius and his crony bishops didn't. No, I never pretend that there will be a Saint Gregory, uh, Saint Gregory the wine drinker. I, that's not the issue. The issue is not who of us is the saint, but the issue is who is right. See, I got a bumper sticker that says, I'd rather be right than politically correct, and that's exactly my life motto. I'd rather be right than politically correct. And I'd rather be, I'd rather be one of the last few hundred members of the Catholic Church than one of the one billion members of the Church of the New Advent. If numbers decide who is right, then I can tell you who is right. The Muslims are. They have the most members. <laughs> right? One and a half billion people can't be wrong. <laughs> so our God is Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Numbers do not count before God. God said, few will make it, many are chosen. Few will make, excuse me, many are called, few are chosen. I'm not saying I'm the chosen one, I just give you the truth here. If I make it to heaven, you'll find out after the last judgment if I made it, but you definitely can rest assured about the fact that I will try my very best to give you what I have received, traditivobis quotet ac cepi, as Archbishop Lefebvre said all of his lifetime. Are there serious questions regarding the validity of other sacraments? Yes, so. If baptism is administered on the highway in the case of an emergency with dirty water and a Muslim that you had for dinner the night before and who is now disposed towards you and who will baptize your child that you just wanted to get to the parish to be baptized, a Muslim can do it if he has the intention to make you a favor, to do you a favor, if his intention is to do what the church would do in such a case, which means his intention is to do what the church does. I'm representing church teaching, mind you. If he grabs the water, you're in there in the car, you can't move. He grabs the water and he pours it over the child's head saying, I baptize thee in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's definitely administering valid baptism. But if the local parish priest ignores the books, sometimes if he doesn't ignore the books, most of the times if he ignores the books that have been issued uh, legally and says all that talk about original sin is really a lot of baloney, we don't have to get rid of original sin because there is no such thing as original sin. The whole purpose of baptism is to make you a member of our beautiful community. Then even if it uses water and the right formula, he will not baptize validly. That's a dogma. Because Leo XIII defined dogmatically that if somebody out of his own will and his own decision and against the law leaves out essentials in the right of the sacrament, even if he has the intention to do the right thing, cannot do it anymore. So baptism today sometimes is indeed invalid because you get enough screwballs around who would act exactly the way I just did. The sacrament of confirmation today is practically invalid all over. 
not only because Paul VI granted them to use vegetable oil, peanut oil, and similar atrocities that no elevator or car would ever accept as sufficient <laughs> for baptism, when for 2,000 years the only valid matter was olive oil. Also, the new form of confirmation is accept the Holy Ghost or accept the Holy Spirit. That's not sufficient. It doesn't mean anything. You accept the Holy Spirit in all seven sacraments. It's impossible to receive confirmation validly if it only says accept the Holy Spirit. Leo XIII says that in the same document I mentioned before that condemns uh, Anglican ordinations. Okay? Then, if you take confession, if the priest in confession does not say, I absolve you from your sins in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but says to you, well, see, what you tell me here is all very interesting, but it's not really a sin, so go home in peace. Or if he says, well, Christ our Lord would absolve you of your mistaken actions, politically correct speech, there's no sin, there's a mistaken action. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you leave the confessional without absolution. Invalid sacrament. He has to agree to the sins confessed and absolve them with the, with the necessary minimum of formula, which is I absolve, I absolve you from your sins in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We discussed already the validity of Mass. Then with the ordination, we discussed that too. I gave you the example of that Dutch bishop who was not consecrated by the Dutch cardinal and which had a, a, a fact that, that needed a, a, a conditional uh, repetition of the whole rite. And then with extreme unction, if you run around with a bottle of Super Veg 2000, best for your salad, for extreme unction, it won't work because, again, there's the olive oil to be used. And if a priest says, instead of giving you the extreme unction, says, I'm going to make sure you will get healthy again. There's no sacrament. They do that all the time, things like this. You won't believe what happens. I told you about the, the priest in Switzerland. Now, this is re a real happening. I don't make up things like this. My fantasy is, fantasy is not good enough for the things that actually happen, believe me. Facts are stranger than fiction. And there was a priest who said, instead of the, of the conse words of consecration, he said, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the prettiest of them all. Then he had the most beautiful girl present elected as the queen for today's mass, and they went all down to the swimming pool that's under the, under the sanctuary. No kidding. That happened in Zug in Switzerland. Z-U-G, you spell that. In Zug in Switzerland, 1975. And the local bishop was all too happy to be present. So I told you that Blessed Pope Benedict XI said, you in no way may approach doubtful sacraments. So I do not have to prove to you these sacraments are invalid. It's completely sufficient to prove to you it's doubtful. You may not go there. Going through the questions again, where does the present church exist? Does it only exist at present in the St. Pius X society or with the faithful of St. As St. Athanasius once said, no. The Catholic Church exists in two ways the visible objective way. In the visible objective way, the Catholic Church exists wherever the Pope is not denied and the old mass is celebrated. Objectively visible way. That means, as a group, the Society of St. Pius X is the only one. Because as a group, it's not objectively in heresy. I told you that the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King are objectively in heresy. And I told you why. Objectively, I repeat that. That's important that you understand that. Objectively, not the individual priest. Objectively, the society as such, not the individual priest, okay? That's very important to understand. The individual priest very often does not represent what he belongs to. One of my best friends among all the priests in the world is a member of the Institute of Christ the King. He's no heretic. When I asked him, is there a possible way to interpret Vatican II in a Catholic way? No, he said. And I told him, I said, would you ever accept the, new, uh, the Novus Ordo Mass? He said, yes, over my dead body. <laughs> so the individual does not represent the group, but if the group makes a seminarian sign or 
makes a, or either makes a seminary and sign that Vatican II is all right, or kicks out the teacher who speaks against Vatican II, then the group is wrong, period. So in the objective, visible way, the Society of St. Pius X is one of the few groups in the, in the, in the world that are, that are representing or representative of the Catholic Church. But then you see, Father Bolduc is not just an individual who runs his own business and whatever like that, but he is a priest of the Catholic Church, and he does not have to prove that to you because you would have to prove to him that he's not. And you certainly can't do that because he can easily prove to you that he represents the church in his personal opinions, as in his teaching, as, and this is very important for the visible church, his actions up there. You confess with Father Bolduc, you get Catholic doctrine in the confessional. You get the Catholic sacrament of, uh, of, of, of confession because he will follow the old rite in the absolution. You approach him for baptism, you get the Catholic sacrament of baptism with the exorcisms for the, for the, for the child, exactly, with the exorcisms for the child, with uh, the necessary uh, consecration of the child, with the chrism used, you know, and the water as it should be. You approach Father Bolduc for uh, the last rites, he will follow church tradition, and that makes the church visible and makes him automatically a visible member of the church, as I am, because you ask me questions, I give you the answers the church gives as much as I can. And you ask me for a sacrament, you will get what the church granted you as a dogma, by divine right. Remember, I talked about it. That is objectively the church. Subjectively, we cannot pronounce judgment. Subjectively, there might be a heretic sitting here. I hope not, but might be. Subjectively, there might be somebody sitting here who says, all of what Father, Father Hess says is very interesting, but I don't believe a word. In which case, you don't believe church doctrine, which I'm representing right here. Subjectively, we cannot pronounce judgment. Subjectively, you cannot say Mrs. So-and-so who goes to the Novus Ordo every Sunday is not a Catholic. Well, maybe she isn't. Maybe she doesn't know better. Maybe she just had, had, has had the bad luck of being born imbecile. Or she might have the bad luck of never having met Father Bolduc. Or she might have had the bad luck of never meeting any one of you who's capable of explaining what you heard here. You can't judge. You don't know if she belongs to the Catholic Church or not. Who belongs to the Catholic Church subjectively? There's only one who knows. Three persons know it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I'm not even sure how far Our Lady knows these things because, as we know from the apparitions in Fatima, Our Lady is not informed about everything. Our Lady does not know when the ju last judgment will take place. Christ said that. Christ said only the Father knows. Well, it means Father, Son, Holy Spirit know, of course, but uh, God knows and only God knows many things. And among those things that only God knows is the present state of the soul of Father Boltak, Father Hess, and all of you. It's, it's very nice and kind of you if you think that Father Boltak and I are presently at the state of grace. Father Boltak may think about himself that he's in the state of grace, and so do I. But only, only God knows. You cannot know. I cannot know about him. He cannot know about me. And if I, go to, to, if, if I ask Father Boldak to hear my confession, he hears what I say. He does not know if it's the truth that I tell. He presumes. And I won't lie to you anyway, so. But uh, only God knows that. So where does the church exist? Only where you see it. Period. Here you see it. 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.30 on Sunday, 6.30, 6, and all these ungodly hours. <laughs> <laughs> but there you see the church. You see the church. And if God wills, and Father Bolduc does not die, and I do not die, and Sister does her job, you might have me here for Easter next year, and then you will see the church. And you will see the glorious old church, how it was before the popes messed it up. That is where the church is, where you see it. Does it only exist at present in the society of St. Pius X? No, I answer that. It exists where you see it. And the society of St. Pius X priests will be certainly careful in not telling you anything else. They might be kind of partisan for their society. That's fine, they have to be. But they will not tell you the church does not exist outside our society. 
Some of them might think that, that's bad enough, but they will not tell you that. Because if they did, they would be in heresy. We are told that we are in schism since we are not under the local bishop. Would that not put us in the same position as the Russian Orthodox, valid but illicit? It would, if it were true. <laughs> oh yes, sure, it would, if it were true. We are under the local bishop, we just have to refuse his commands because they come from the wrong corner. They do not have the authority necessary. Not because he's the local bishop, but because he's not a Catholic and does not follow Catholic doctrine and Catholic tradition. Just as I said before, why is it that Father Boldak and I are not exactly in perfect harmony with the present Pope? Well, because the present Pope is not exactly in perfect harmony with church teaching tradition and the, even the tradition of canon law. A Pope who speaks heresy, commits schismatical acts, and knows nothing about canon law, is not exactly the man to issue an order for, to me. And this is the same, and in a worse way, even for the local diocesan bishop. See, you could even be, for some reasons, a personal friend of the local bishop, but you surely, hopefully, will not do what he says, and even less what he does. So, uh, schism needs the rejection of the authority as such. If anybody says to you, you are in schism, you're not under the local bishop, you give him the right answer, which starts with the words B-U-L-L, and then you tell him, the one who is in schism here is you, because you attend a mass that is against divine will and law, while I follow the church tradition and therefore follow the will of Christ. And your bishop, the bishop you just mentioned, does not follow the will of Christ and does not heed Christ's wishes. So the one who is in schism is you, not me. Bye if he doesn't want to listen. But please, be always kind, always charitable, and always nice, and infinitely patient with those who want to listen. One of the problems of traditionalists in this country is that very often they are real, die-hard, arrogant people. I hate that. If somebody comes the usual innocent way, excuse me, Father, but the way I see it, you're really in schism, and then I say, no, madam, that is not the case. And she says, why? Then she will get my attention and patience, and patience, and patience, and patience. And please, be patient with them. And if you can't answer the question, then say, I'll talk to you later. I'll look it up. I do not know everything. Only God does. And then you look it up. Either you ask for the bull duck, and if for some, he's not omniscient either. Only God knows everything. Then you look up my tapes. I'm not omniscient either. You don't find the answer on my tape. You keep looking. And then maybe one day you can come back, to, come, come back to that friend of yours and say, now I found the reason for what I was saying. But be patient with them. Only if they say, you are in schism and I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Say, thank God, yes, please keep your promise. <laughs> There is a letter from Monsignor Pell that I'm uh, asked to answer. Monsignor Pell is the secretary of the commission called Ecclesia Dei, based on that fraudulent document that I discussed the day before yesterday. So it's a fraudulent commission. How fraudulent it is, you will see with my reading two paragraphs to you. The Society of St. Pius X has consistently denied that the excommunication took effect, excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre, I explained that to you, and so on. As the, to the priests of the Society of St. Pius X, the Church has not thus far made an authoritative declaration in their regard. It is clear that they are suspended, that it is forbidden by the Church law to celebrate the sacraments because of irregular ordination, and so on. We must strongly counsel against participating in the Masses, well, of course, what else? And then, with such an attitude, the Society of St. Pius X is effectively tending to establish its own canons of orthodoxy 
and hence to separate itself from the magisterium of the Supreme Pontiff. You know, the most boring thing about the society of St. Pius X is that they never came up with anything new. They follow church tradition, and with one exception against patriotism, which I have mentioned the day before yesterday and have uh, indicated today, you will not get anything but church doctrine from them. And if anybody of those, any one of those priests says something contrary to church uh, doctrine to you, and you denounce him, he will be effective. I can guarantee you that because I'm a personal witness to that. According to the Canon 751 of the Code of Canon Law, such refusal of submission to the Roman Pontiff or the communion with members of the church subject to him constitutes schism. The Society of St. Pius X refuses communion like I do with heretics and schismatics. They do not refuse communion with the Bishop of Green Bay because he's the Bishop of Green Bay. They do not refuse communion with the Archbishop of Milwaukee because he's the Archbishop of Milwaukee. They refuse communion with him because he's a heretic and a schismatic. See, but the, these people, they try to confuse you by not, by deliberately omitting those distinctions. And then they say, a further point of law is that since the priests of the Society of St. Pius X do not enjoy the faculties of the diocese, any marriage at which they preside are invalid, and likewise the absolution which they impart in the sacrament of penance is also invalid. I've talked to you about that. I told you that uh, why these are not invalid. We, we are talking about the state of emergency, the New Yorkers say. Um, it's a state of emergency, and you cannot approach any one of the, the priests in Green Bay or Milwaukee or similar for the sacraments because all you will get is the Novus Ordo Bologna, including the moral theology involved. And the poor girl who is just about to marry will maybe have to learn how to paint with her fingers, but she will not le learn anything about the sacrament of matrimony. Under those circumstances, it is impossible to approach a priest like this because you're not allowed to approach heretics or doubtful sacraments. At the same time, by divine law, it has been granted to you that, to, to, uh, that you have a right to the traditionally handed down liturgy in the Catholic Church of the Roman Rite, the Roman Latin Rite. At the same time, uh, we have a right to approach a priest for the sacraments. So if you cannot approach these people, and the only one around that will guarantee you uh, really the uh, correct moral theology that is involved in confession, the correct education about marriage that is involved with that sacrament, and the only one so far around is Father Bolduc. You have to go to Father Bolduc. You can't choose because the only other priest in the area is Fraternity of St. Peter, and I've talked about them, I hope, abundantly clear, but you will be able to ask questions on that. So uh, the... Uh, and then, of course, regarding marriage, I mentioned the, the canon 1116, even the new code of canon law, which these people know but do not talk about. Even the new code of canon law grants you to marry without the local priest for sufficient reason. And if heresy is not a sufficient reason, I wouldn't know what is. <laughs> so commenting on this abominable standard, by the way, standard, they photocopied, send it to